like to call the order tonight's regular Board of Education meeting for Wednesday, January 25th, 2023, here in the boardroom. Can we have a roll call, please, Tammy? Maria Wolstein? Here. Brett Waller? Here. Linda Gingling? Here. Paul Perl? Here. Chad Krieger? Here. Ron Liberty? Here. Kendra Osmond? Here. Jacqueline Gremlin? Here. Kevin Wink? Here. Can you join me and stand as you're able to face the flag for our Pledge of Allegiance? to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening and welcome to the Merrill Area Public Schools Board of Education. Next, respects the role of our elected board members right here that they serve in the function of our board meetings. <coughs> board members and administrators are committed to working collaboratively to provide our students with a safe learning environment and the highest level of achievement. This meeting is a formal event, and professional conduct is the expectation of all in attendance. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Murray. First on our agenda is public comments to the board. I do have a comment form filled out, just as a reminder, board members, the board does allow 15 minutes at the beginning of each regular meeting for members of the public to speak. Speakers are allocated three minutes to address the board. If you have a large group, we do ask that you designate one representative to speak. Board members may only ask clarifying questions during the public comment section, but we'll usually postpone further discussion or action until further public input. That being said, I will invite Paul Holman to the uh, microphone at this table, if you'd sit there, Paul. <coughs> Introduce yourself and your topic, please, and we'll go from there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, board members. I appreciate uh, you taking the time to listen tonight. My name is Paul Holman. I represent the New Testament Church Christian Academy here in town. I did send out an email uh, to our principal, athletic director, a few coaches, as well as the board. Um, prior to this, just so you weren't so you were aware of what I was going to share tonight. I'm going to share just uh, basically what I sent in the email for you tonight, and I appreciate you listening again. The New Testament Church Christian Academy was established in 1990. It's currently the only K-12 through private school in the Mary Merrill area that I believe. We do not participate in the school's voucher system. Therefore, the tax dollars from all of our students' families are contributed to the MAPS. We do not have enough students as of right now to participate in team sports um, at the high school um, at this time, high school level, excuse me. I'm here tonight to inquire to find out if our high school students would be able to participate in your athletic program. We currently have five eligible students, not enough for a team. Some of our middle school students right now are participating in soccer, football, and basketball through the Merrill Public School. They are excited for the opportunity to continue in their sports throughout high school and to be able to continue the valuable friendships and community they built along the way. We were asking if we can come together as a community for the benefit of our children to find a solution to allow them access to high school athletics. We've discussed this in various, with various coaches and teachers. They've expressed interest as well in having our students participate to help continue to build our athletic program and give our students an opportunity to play. We've also talked with the principal as well as the athletic director for help concerning this matter. We recognize that it would be constructive for all of the children of Merrill to have the opportunity to reap many benefits of athletics, such as teamwork, work ethic, sportsmanship, and the like. We feel athletics should be available regardless of whether families choose public school, private school, or homeschooling based on their individual child's needs. We've heard the WIA does not allow for students who are not registered with the MAPS to participate in your athletics program. We're asking if we can find a way for all students who are in the Merrill area to be able to participate. We've learned from teachers in other school districts that they do allow private school students to participate in the high school athletic programs. And currently looking into this matter, I have reached out to those districts. I have yet to, um, I have yet to be able to talk with the athletic directors there, um, but I am pursuing this just so you are aware. I am asking tonight if we can explore, possibly explore the op uh, options such as the possibility of a charter, a co-op, or perhaps even having our students being enrolled in an elective class through the MAPS to be registered. And we would sincerely appreciate your help in this matter. Thank you very much for your time. 
Thank you, Paul. Before you step away, I just ask if any board members have any clarifying questions, and keeping in mind it would be clarifying questions to the comment versus engaging in dialogue at this time. How many high school kids do you have? Five. Total? In total five right now. That's, so that's why I'm saying that's yes. enrolled in your school. Is there the high schoolers. Five? We have more enrolled, but high school is five, correct. You had said that there was a conversation with the activities director or athletic director, as you said, or no? With Merrill yes. Athletic? I have talked to, yes, Mr. Arneson. Okay, and what was the Just in passing. Okay. He was, so you can ask him, but I asked him, he said, as it was new to him, something he'd have to look into, and that's kind of where, where we went. Okay, thank you. No problem. So, point of clarification, board members can't have a dialogue, but yeah. I'm going to give the floor to Superintendent Murray. He has a little more legal latitude at an open meeting, so I know we've done a little bit of, of research. I'll turn it over to Superintendent Murray just for kind of next steps and, and what, yep. what he knows to kind of share with everybody. So, I'm going to turn that over to Shannon right now. So, Mr. Holman, I appreciate you coming in. Um, I saw your letter to, I believe it was Kelly um, Blake, who made me deal with the director and today I, uh, so I forwarded your letter on to the WIA. I think I knew the answer but I want to clarify yep. the challenge here is that we support everything you're saying but it's not our fight yep. so we as a member school of the WIA have to adhere to their rules and so in order for us to even have that discussion with your school uh, to cooperate in those kind of things um, you would have to become a member of the WIA before we even have that so then I believe it's three years and so, as it sits now, if we're interested in being a member school of the WIA, WIA, which I believe we are, um, we have to adhere to those rules. Sure. So our middle school is not by yeah. choice. That's a choice that I just made some time ago. And so, because our middle school is not a member, um, we can allow all students in our community, including yours, to participate in those activities. We even looked at sub varsity things. You know, it's good for your students to participate and not, but not at the varsity level. And the answer was no. So as long as we're a member school. Um, I think your fight is with them. Sure. So. And as a board, in, in the future or later in this meeting, we can give direction for items for future meetings if we have thoughts on that. But I just wanted Shannon's discussion here just to let you know where we were at, Paul, just in a few days since we got your email. Yep. So. And Paul, we certainly would want your students to participate. You know, so we can just. That's okay. I appreciate it. This is all, that's why I'm here, just for answers, clarification. I'm just learning as well. And just for clarification for me too, that's because New Testament is a private school as opposed to most public schools who are members of the WIA. No, as a private school, they could be members of the WIA. So they would just yes. need to become members. And then we years. Got it. There's a three-year probationary we would have to adhere to. Yeah. Then the discussion becomes, when we have this discussion, the discussion becomes, do we as a district want to cooperate with another right. school? And then there's a whole set of other criteria, right. whole programs we can on their own, et cetera. Uh, we did opt not to do that with EDA um, because we would have a four or five year high school kids for potential by So that was not a So the first hurdle is the WIA yeah. membership, and then going into whether or not a co op is viable. Yeah, so for, as it is now, we couldn't even have that discussion. Aren't we a co-op with the hockey? We are, um, because um, uh, schools schools request to be part of a co-op because neither program is viable as a standalone. Okay. So that's becoming more and more common. Perhaps lacrosse as well. But again, yeah. sport and lacrosse. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Any other members of our community for public comments? Thank you all for being here this evening. We'll go right into board recognition next. At this time, I would like to uh, recognize for the board Ellie Woke and the band members who marched in the tournament of Roses Parade in Pasadena. You would join me for a photo and an opportunity to speak a little bit about what is going on in Pasadena. I'm just going to 
nice belly and then at least uh, so just a little bit of information about us. So I have here um, joining me a couple of the seniors who went on the trip. Um, so we have Jaden and Maya and Daphne, Ian and Caleb, and we've appointed our drum major here to talk a little bit about the <laughs> trip. So, <laughs> um, so we were down in California, um, in Pasadena, for like about a week, and we obviously marched in the Road Bowl Parade on uh, Monday, because they couldn't have it on Sunday since it was the tradition. Um, so that was really awesome, you know, you turn this big corner and it's like, it's just a super cool opportunity since we're a small band and we couldn't do it on our own, so we like conjoined with a bunch of other Northwoods bands and we got to march in the Rosewood Parade. And we also had Band Fest, so that was like on Friday, so we got to play like a couple of like pep band tunes on the field and um, all the other like marching bands that were going in the parade, they also got to do theirs too, so that was also cool. cool. And also Delmer, he drove our trailer down to California. He left like Christmas Eve, I think. Yeah. So oh. and he drove all the way down for us, and then he drove all the way back after. So I'm super appreciative. And built a ton of stuff. Mm -hmm. in our trailer. So. So pack it all in. It was full. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Uh, this is what we'd like to share. Um, I mean, Daphne hit a lot of it. It was just a really awesome opportunity. Um, like she said, for us because. We, in order to do the Rose Parade, you have to, I think, have at least 100 to 150 members in your marching band, um, which for the Northwoods, Central Wisconsin area isn't possible just with our um, schools, yeah, our school numbers and everything. So it was really neat to have this opportunity and have the Rose Parade president actually an Eagle River um, alum. And so putting that all together was just, it was, it was awesome. Once in a lifetime experience. How many students totally from Merrill went? From Merrill, we had 53. Yeah. <coughs> Any other questions or board members? Well, it's a great job. Congratulations. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>
Delmer. Thank you. Uh, next on our board recognition, uh, I would like to, uh, as the board to recognize Amber Winter for being the state champion in swimming in the 100 breaststroke, as well as placing seventh in the 200 IM. I asked um, the AD Scott Arneson for a few words about Amber. And he shared that Amber is an awesome student athlete. She has put the time in. The state dedicated throughout the high school and hard work and dedication has paid off in the classroom and in the school equals success. Great student, great athlete, great individual, great role model. She has set a great standard for other student athletes to strive for. She also as an individual that depicts good things come to those who work hard. So we have Amber Winter, state champion. Thanks for representing Merrill with class and also some of her teammates that were there for the at the state swim meet in the 200 medley relay, Megan Miles, Addison, Jerovic, and Bailey Summer. Congratulations to all of you. something from your experience at state swimming yeah it was a really good last year um, in my opinion this was the hardest working team I've ever been a part of and I want to thank them especially because they pushed me to my ultimate max and I definitely think that they are the reason and part that I became state champion so I want to thank you guys for pushing me every single day at practice um, my last year at state was really fun they made it really fun the bus ride was really fun. We ate a lot of ton of ice cream before. <laughs> so maybe that was it, all the sugar. But, uh, thank you for this wonderful last year. Anything you girls would like to add as part of the relay team and your experiences at State? Well, I do have to say this this was my first year going to State as a senior and I really I really did not expect all the hypeness and all the the fun stuff that was happening in the back while we were watching as like I, I'm just amazed and everybody's all pumped up and everybody's all all happy and excited and it really inspired me to go to places like this. I'm just glad that I got the opportunity to go because you never know where like I probably wouldn't have been able to make it two years in a row without all these people. <laughs> it's really great for the girls. Absolutely, and we're very proud of you, and I understand uh, some of you may be doing that in college as well, so congratulations as you continue on with your uh, future in, uh, in swimming and academics, of course, as well, so congratulations. Our sophomores scheduled Wednesday and our freshmen will be scheduling tomorrow. Um, this is very exciting for our students as we look ahead to the year before us. And then last Friday, January 20th, our Skills USA team was given the opportunity to compete in a competition where they were able to show off their unique talents. This group did an amazing job of representing MHS as they brought home many awards. Specifically, we would like to congratulate 
Maya Grapp, Adeline Blake, and Sebastian Doring on taking first place for team problem solving. Alex Brown placed first in his first aid in CPR. Noah Moore placed second for his CO2 dragster, and Grace Collinsworth placed third for her welding sculpture. Seeing as winter is in full spring, full swing, it seems only fitting that Winterfest will be coming up for our students at MHS on February 22nd. This is a day where flex periods are extended and advisory periods, and instead of focusing on schoolwork during those periods, teachers host fun activities and students can sign up and take part in. It is a great chance for students not only to have fun, but also to create bonds with their teachers outside of problem solving, editing sentences, and learning about the Revolutionary War. It gives students a day to look forward to and supply them with a slight break from the stress that school can at times cause. Great. So, as you just heard, the Wisconsin Northwoods Marching Band, which included members from our high school, had the amazing opportunity to be a part of the Rose Bowl Parade in Pasadena, California. The band members practiced for months, and the fruit of their labors was to perform in front of a massive audience, both in person and on TV. It was an amazing opportunity for students to put their talents on display for an audience outside of just central Wisconsin. Seniors are beginning to work on scholarship applications. Although they are a lot of work, students are excited for the opportunity to earn some money to put towards their futures. Seniors this year also have a unique opportunity, as it is Merrill's turn to offer the Herb Cole Student Initiative Scholarship. This scholarship is worth $10,000 and cycles between schools from year to year, and it's Merrill's turn this year. Seniors will continue their applications for this scholarship and many more as the due date for these is coming up in just under two weeks. Dinner and a Show is coming up on February 18th. This is a choir performance that includes, as the name implies, Dinner and a Show. The singers have been practicing their pieces as well as their serving skills because not only is the meal supplied, the singers have to serve the meal themselves. This concert of sorts is a very unique chance for choir members to show their skills in a fun and unique way. Thank you, Brooke. Isaiah, any board members have any questions for our student representatives? Who's cooking? Are they cooking? <laughs> Are we trying to uh, affect uh, attendance one way or the other? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> what was going to be on the menu? You know, yeah. the you know, the students don't actually cook. No. They just serve the meal. <laughs> Based on history, it's guaranteed to be a terrible weather day. <laughs> that, 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 that is also <laughs> almost always canceled. <laughs> Any other questions from board members? Thanks, Brooke. Thanks, Jose. I appreciate the updates and everything going on in Merrill High School. Next on our agenda is our administrative reports. Just a reminder that board members ask questions uh, leading up to this meeting, but certainly can ask clarifying questions or things on the record as we are here this evening. But at this point, I will turn it over to Superintendent Murray for administrative reports. Thank you. Uh, first uh, report on our docket tonight is the Director of Curriculum Instruction Report with a focus on behavior, uh, positive behavior intervention supports. Questions or comments on that report. Next is the report uh, regarding the Pine River School for Young Learners, including monthly data, enrollment numbers, etc. Mr. Martinovich is here for uh, answering questions that the board may have. Are there any questions or comments? Next report is the food service update, it includes board bites and participation reports for the month of December. Um, are there any questions that you have to have? Report uh, B, Director of Business Service Report, talks about budget planning for 2024, uh, the audit, change of payroll, some of those things will be coming up at, uh, this evening uh, with more detail. But I'm going to ask Dr. Strike to, to step up to the, um, the table with there for a second because there are some questions that, uh, regarding annualized pay that we'll just uh, have her address. <laughs> no, I think I answered. Yeah, I think okay, we answered that. Good. Just that we are making adjustments for next year. Um, we shared. We have a listening session with staff in regard to just both information and gather feedback and making that adjustment. Um, shared that we would have a uh, plan to share with them at the, by the end of January. Um, our team actually met yesterday and we're finalizing that plan to share. Oh, 
so what that will look like in the future. And I said I can certainly um, bring that plan to the February maybe finance HR committee to look into it a little bit depth if you want to see it. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions while we have Dr. Thank you. <laughs> Next Sorry. is the Director of Buildings and Grounds Transportation Update. Bill Bergman is here to answer any questions or address any comments. Are there any questions or comments? And then finally, is the Superintendent Report. I'm just going to run through a couple things from mine. Um, last week, Kevin, Bill Bergman, and Kelly and I had the chance to get down to the State Education Convention in Milwaukee. Um, that was my first time there in a very long time. I was there probably 16 years ago with uh, Dr. Sarah Sarnstrom and she brought her team down there. So it's been a long time I've been there, but it was very interesting. I think the sessions were great. Um, I attended sessions on referendum planning because I don't have enough of that in my life. <laughs> uh, sessions on strategic planning and long-term long -term planning. Um, some interesting information about superintendent evaluations that we can share throughout the spring. Uh, some sessions on board relations and community engagement. There's some really good topics on community engagement. I think that would be useful for us. Um, I'll ask Dale or Kelly, do you have anything that you'd like to share from your experience at the convention? I'll ask Kevin the same after. I'd just like to say it's um, a privilege I feel to be able to go down there and collaborate with other school districts and professionals in the industry. I focused a lot on facility planning, stuff like that, um, capital budgeting, tightening up the pocketbook, and I also attended a bunch of referendum sessions as well. The, the biggest value I said though is, is collaborating with other school districts. We are kind of a copycat league in this business, so we try to find what works in other districts and bring it home to us. So I'd just like to thank the board for um, affording me the opportunity to go down and attend those things. Um, this was my a first for me um, to attend the convention. I attended a number of sessions um, related to finance, obviously HR related topics. But I would agree with Dale, I think the networking with others is very valuable. Um, and even some of the vendors I work with, I had the opportunity, for example, to kind of revisit our, pro our budget projection with Forecast 5 um, Frontline, say Frontline now. Um, and they had, no one's hit yet, but the governors um, met with us and spoke to us. So that was, it's always, I think, a great opportunity to hear from the governor and hear his latest um, thoughts on budget for the future. So, thank you. A couple things I'll add. This was either my fifth or sixth time down at the state convention. Uh, I start my week off on Tuesday afternoon with a pre-convention workshop. This year I chose inclusive school board leadership. I really focused on equitable success in, in academic outcomes, so you're not getting too specific, but things we probably heard from Glenda in the past, just how, how do you narrow down what we need curricularly or what things could help, and it was, they put it in layman's terms for board members, and it was just eye-opening just what other districts are going through because you could be sitting at a table with someone from Racine, someone from Milwaukee versus someone I think also I had at our table was from Oregon or Sun Prairie and, and just a whole different look at things as far as what their demographics were. But just to echo what uh, Shannon Kelly and Dale said, I, I went to topics on uh, referendums, and school finance, budget, uh, strategic planning, facilities and then also kind of rounded out uh, kind of the board side, boardmanship, chain of command, onboarding new board members. Um, we had three different keynote speakers besides listening to or having the opportunity to hear from Governor Evers and State Superintendent Underly. Um, my one takeaway was um, I guess listening to everything that I, I did here. I was very proud of our board work here. One of the things that our second keynote, uh, Sarita Maven, said it was a spin on an old saying, I mean what you say, say what you mean. And then she paused and said, but don't say it mean. <laughs> just, there's a way to do that. And I smiled because a lot of the different breakout sessions talked about fighting in the boardroom. And I came back with, no matter if we agree or not, we've all been very professional and come across presenting our information and doing what's best for the students and staff. So I was very proud to listen to that and, and be reminded of that. Sometimes we get one topic that's 
maybe not our, our favorites and we go back and forth, but at the end of the day, we're doing what we feel is right for our students. So it was great to uh, be reminded of that. Sometimes we need that reminder. So thanks also for that opportunity to be down there. Um, the delegate assembly, which I am our MAPS delegate, just to picture what this is like. Uh, we go through WASB, we got the resolution um, email that linked us through. We have nine members here that are, are talking about any potential agenda items to start. Um, the delegate assembly had 291 of the 400 plus school districts in an assembly hall. It seemed like at any one time, 10 to 15 wanted to speak, like we were turning it into law, not just suggesting what our WASB lobbyists or delegates would do with that information. So it was very interesting to hear what was important to other districts there and to have the opportunity to speak to represent MAPS. So another good learning opportunity there. Turn it back over to you. We, uh, the four of us did have a chance to meet with Bray Myron. Uh, during one of the afternoons, um, that was the group that got approved to do the facility study last, uh, I'll say recently. Um, and one of the things that we discussed was, um, so we approved the Brady uh, contract, and then we discussed the referendum not happening in April. And so when we met with Brady, we kind of um, did extend the timeline, because, because we had agreed on that, but kind of changed our approach. So in February, uh, they will give an update through Dale and I, their progress. In fact, they're coming in, I think, next week already? The 6th. The 6th, with, with their architects and engineers to start with all our facilities. And then at the end of the month, in March, um, they'll report what we have and we'll have a little bit of a, kind of a workshop kind of a situation. And so uh, I think that's progressing along. And I thought that was a very productive meeting. They asked great questions um, about all of our facilities and how we use things. And so I'm looking forward to them in the New York setting. Uh, and, and then the last bullet point to talk about um, uh, communications and those kind of things is one of the things that came out of uh, a session that I attended in the, in the field of and, and we've been approached by several people who want to know how they could help after that thing failed in the community. And so one of the concepts that we're exploring that I'll be presenting next week is this notion of a key communicators group that is kind of like um, uh, ambassadors that can help message things that could eventually, uh, you know, as we approach 24, could be helpful in that capacity. So I'll be talking to proposal for it in that next time. And that is all I have. All right, any questions for Shannon on his superintendent report? All right, thank you, Shannon. Next on our agenda is the committee reports. So uh, we'll start with the facilities committee attached to the draft minutes from our January 4th committee meeting. Myself as chair and other members of the committee are available for questions. Do we have any questions this evening for the Facilities Committee? Any questions for Facilities Committee? Hearing none, we'll then mention the Finance Human Resources Committee, attached with the draft minutes from the January 11th committee meeting. Members of that committee are Available on Brett Waller as chair and other members of the committee. Any questions for the Finance Human Resources Committee? Any questions for Finance HR? Hearing none, we'll move to the CTP or Curriculum Technology Pupil Services Committee, attached for the draft minutes from the January 11th committee meeting. Maria Volpe is chair and other members of the committee are available for questions. Do we have any questions for our CTP committee? Any questions for our CTP committee? Hearing none, we will move on down the agenda. Unfinished business, we do not have anything on the agenda classified as such. So we'll move to Board of Education business. Our first topic there is fiscal year 2020 <coughs> annual financial audit with a topic summary sheet from Dr. Kelly Strike. Shannon, any intro on that before I ask no. about the recommended motion? No, I turned it around to cut it and do the interview. Yep, so I'll introduce something coming up. John Troutman and uh, Stuart Randall have been working on this for a while. Um, they're going to be presenting their 
from CLA, and you probably have met on <laughs> Um CLA has been our auditor for a number of years, and I think they were here last year as well to just give an overview of our audit from 21-22. Um, so you'll notice in your topic summary, we have a number of um, documents that they may reference. Um, so they'll give a little overview, and then here for questions. Well, good afternoon, first of all. Uh, thanks for having us uh, in front of you to, to present tonight. My name is John Troutman, principal for CLA. This is Stuart Randall, manager. And I'll turn it over to him to do the presentation, but just uh, kind of an overview of what we're, we're trying to accomplish today is really just a, a short 15, 20 minute discussion, high level discussion on the audit, go through the results, go through a little bit of financial information. Certainly interrupt us at any point if you have questions, or at the end we can we can do a, a little Q&A at the end. But Certainly our, our, our goal here is to give you a high level overview. So with that, I'll turn it over to Stuart. Yep, um, good evening, thanks for having us here. Um, like Kelly mentioned, got a couple of documents. Um, one is about 80 some pages long, that is the full financial statements. I'm not gonna spend too much time in there because it's 80 pages of dense financial footnotes and um, schedules, but if you, if you had time to review any of that and want to ask anything about that question, so that's what we're here for. Um, Two of the other documents, one is about a 10-page governance communication and the other is a two-page management letter. Um, I'm gonna start with the 10-page governance communication, which as is our formal communication to you as governance of the school district. So the first section of that report explains what we have done as your auditors. We have audited the financial statements of the district in accordance with governmental auditing standards, but also um, the federal uniform grant guidance and the state single audit. So what that means is we've not only looked at the overall financial <coughs> statements, but um, whenever an entity spends over a certain threshold of federal awards, we also have to do a internal control and compliance audit associated with those federal and state awards. Um, the results of those audits, um, we were able to issue an unmodified opinion on the financial statements, which is the best opinion that you can get. It means that the financial statements um, reflect the financial position of the school district as of June 30th, 2022, and for the year then ended. Um, so that is a very good thing. That is what everyone hopes to get, and that is what the district has received. Um, in terms of the single audit reports, um, we didn't have any deficiencies this year. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about the specific um, findings and recommendations we did have as part of our financial statements, but in um, previous years, just because of turnover, because of the new grants for various reasons, we did have some findings associated with um, S, um, the ESSER grants and the IDEA grants, and we were able to not, the, the district was able to implement procedures to rectify those findings, and we did not have to repeat the findings this year. So that is a very good thing. Federal government starts to, uh, we, we have to identify whenever there's a repeat finding, and the federal government does not like to see repeat findings. So good that the district was able to resolve those. So that was the first section of the government's communication. Um, going down a little bit further on the first page, it talks a little bit about the county policies. Now, I'd say about every three years, give or take now, there's a new accounting standard that went, that goes into effect. Um, the school district's accounting policies are governed by the Governmental Accounting Standards Board. And this past year, um, a new standard went into effect changing the accounting for leases. Um, previously, some items that were identified just as operating leases are now reflected differently within the financial statements of the district. Just if you pull out last year's financial statements and put them next to this year's financial statements, they will look slightly different. Um, the standard didn't have a significant effect um, on the overall financial presentation of the district, but just wanted to point it out that there is a slight change. Um, looking forward into next year, there will be an additional change associated with um, subscription-based IT arrangements. Um, I do know that DPI has already made changes to the woofer to accommodate some of the necessary account changes, the account structure of the district. So not only does um, DPI have guidance out there, but we're always able to assist the district in evaluating how the new accounting standard um, affects the finances of the school district. Um, continuing down, we, we talk a little bit about the accounting estimates. Um, as much as we want accounting to be black and white, it never is, and there's always some um, estimates associated with other post-employment benefits, depreciation, accumulated sick leave, and the pension asset. Nothing unusual there. Um, continuing down onto the second page now, you know, dip, any, we didn't, uh, excuse me, we did not encounter any significant difficulties associated with the audit. Um, 
none of the misstatements that we identified were material to the audit. Um, at the very bottom of that page, once again, we're noting that there's the change in accounting principle. Just drawing that out uh, as a point of emphasis. Uh, moving on to the third page, um, yeah, about two thirds of the way down, other audit findings or issues. We did have two findings this year primarily associated with just the overall finances of the district. Um, segregation of duties and preparation of annual financial report. Um, the preparation of annual financial report um, is pretty much universal for most school districts and governmental entities nowadays. It essentially refers to the preparation of the 82 page financial statements. Um, it is the district's responsibilities, these financial statements, but due to the complexity of them, most school districts end up contracting with the auditors um, or a secondary entity to prepare them. That This is just our communication saying, yes, we did prepare them. It is the district's responsibility. You didn't do it. And it is still the district's responsibility to assume responsibility and ensure that the, the accuracy of the overall financial data within the financial statements. The second one, segregation of duties. Uh, this is a repeat of a finding from last year, but last year was material weakness, and this year we were, we were able to decrease the significance to significant deficiency. Um, in terms of findings, material weakness is you know, essentially saying that there is something fundamentally wrong with the internal controls of the district. Something has a high likelihood of going wrong. Significant deficiency, the definition is a deficiency that is less severe than material weakness. So um, in this case, there's just some duties that because of the turnover that the um, business office has had, wasn't fully able to be redesigned. Um, we've talked a little bit with Kelly um, during the audit process um, in terms of some of the banking items and journal entry processes needed to be tweaked to hopefully make that go away for next year. But whenever there's turnover in key financial positions, it's always an opportunity for the district to evaluate what their current policies, procedures, um, practices are and try and um, segregate the duties, resign the duties as best as possible to ensure that no one position has significant control over any financial um, transaction, process, procedure. I think the key there, I guess, just from a standpoint of um, kind of takeaways from the board level as far as what do we do, we have these findings. And again, obviously, very good news that you're able to reduce that. that that's, a, that's a significant thing to talk about because that means it is a, a lower level finding, which is, that's key, but, but it's still there. So, so the takeaways there really as a district is, you know, there's mitigating controls that have to be in place. And there's a lot of districts in Wisconsin that have segregation of duties. There's a lot of districts that have material weakness segregation of duties. And that's based on budgets and, and cost of, of adding people and things like that. But it, irrelevant to that, when you have issues like that, there is a risk and, and there is a, 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 a mitigating control that you have to do it. And the board becomes a, an important part of that, where you review things and you, you, you're, you're investigating and, and reviewing and signing off on things as part of your board meetings. And that's really key because it's an important part of that process. And not to say that a board and governance isn't important at a very large school district with, with a lot of segregation and no findings at all, because it still is, but it is kind of your, your one line of, of defense and your mitigating control of some of those segregation duties. So again, good news, you're, you're heading on the right track, that's the main takeaways there, but also as a governance and as, as a governing body, keep in mind that it is important also to keep an eye on disbursements and payroll, things like that as you review and approve things. So I'll pause there. Are there any follow-up questions on the findings or status of any of that? Maria? Just a quick question, and, and maybe it's just so much paperwork, but where do I see a comparison of last year's findings to this year's findings? I, I, that is not in any of the documents. You would have to pull up last year's reports. Um, there is a document that Kelly is in the preparation of which um, I don't know if it was included in the packet. It is the status of prior year findings and the current year corrective action plan. So that includes what the district implemented or if the, if the findings were rectified from last year um, and what the district is planning on doing associated with the findings from this year. Okay, I thought last year we had asked for a comparison going forward. So it does say uh, if the last document that Kelly has on is called corrective. Yep, that's the document. Yeah, and so it does show last year's Got it. So I just need to go back and forth between the two documents. Okay. Yeah, the corrective action plan will actually bring both 
findings on the same document. So you don't have to go back and forth. It's actually in that document. And in the full text of the current year findings, um, they're about a page each, is towards the end of the 82 page financial statements if you want the full you know, verbiage of the findings. Okay. I'll look further. Thank you. Yep. Um, so I, I'm going to take this opportunity to transition over to the smaller two page management letter. Um, the management letter is our opportunity as your auditors to just make recommendations just about process improvements or items that we think can improve the financial record keeping of the um, district. Um, the first comment is associated with the community service um, fund facility use charge. This is associated with the activities with the annual fund 80. Um, a couple of years ago, DPI came out with or changed some of their guidance or reinterpreted some state statutes. And if you have some fund 80 activities, like your middle school sports that uses district facilities, what DPI has now communicated is that the fund 80 needs to pay the general fund for some of the overhead costs that are incurred associated with the use of district facilities. Um, this is to ensure that the general fund, the main operating fund of the district, is only incurring expenses associated with the education of students. By definition, by including something in Fund 80, the district is saying this is not part of the normal, normal instructional purposes of the school district and this community service. And so there are overhead costs, whether it's the use of mowing the fields or watering, janitorial costs, that will be incurred additionally or depreciation of fields um, that Fund 10 will pay for, but it really shouldn't pay for, Fund 80 should pay for. So the district should um, develop some type of process to ensure that Fund 80 is paying Fund 10, the general fund, to cover some of those costs to ensure that Fund 10 is only paying for instructional costs. The DPI has made it fairly easy to do that without having to get into a huge indirect cost type situation where you're spending lots of time and it's complicated. They, they just have you identify a facility use charge and then have it based on based on actual usage, so it can't just be a number where you just set and that's it. It's a rate that you set based on usage. So if, if a particular fund eighty um, activity uses a classroom three times a week or once a week, you you would go through that entire year, and it can be done once a year and identify a dollar amount based on a reasonable rate, and then you charge it. So it's a, it's a little bit backward because everything in fund eighty throughout the years have always been highly scrutinized by DPI what you can put in there. Now they're telling you to put more in there and pay the Fund 10 back. But it's really driven not on a Fund 80 issue, it's a Fund 10 issue where Fund 10 can only have expenditures related to education. So, yeah. And that's interrupting, but you know the plan that I created is linked in there for that. Perfect. So I've shared that, I've created a plan and shared it with DPI has seen it as well and they've perfect. Go ahead. Yep. So they have the details of that too. Okay. Um, the, ne the next comment is, I, our comment is specific about the payroll liability reconciliation process in which there were some liability accounts that weren't being properly reconciled out throughout the year to ensure that that correct amount was being withheld or then paid. Um, we didn't have any major concerns about this, but I, I kind of want to broaden the overall topic just in terms of you know what I mentioned earlier. Whenever there is changeover in key financial positions, it's an opportunity to start documenting what your financial policies and procedures should be because you know Kelly over the past six, seven months now, six and a half, has had one heck of a learning experience in terms of figuring out the financial position of the school district, what it does and why it does it. And we can make this recommendation anywhere, but it 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 is best practice to document and explain why the district does what it does, you know, why does it make a transfer to Fund 46? What is its process for the facility use charge for Fund 80 we just talked about? You know, how does it determine what the short-term borrowing that needs of the district are on an annual basis? Um, just to help establish why the district does what it does from a financial perspective. And then it can also assist in the identification of the segregation of duties to say, okay, these positions do this, these positions do Y, do, is there enough segregation or does position A have too much to do and we need to move some of it to actually position C? Yeah, yeah it, it, it makes good business sense to do that, right, in any organization, uh, especially in, when you have turnover. But what we're seeing in the industry right now is 
is turnover, a lot of turnover, and a lot of institutional knowledge is, is leaving uh, based on retirements and things. And a lot of times when someone knows something that well, it's not written down. And what we're seeing is, is clients of ours, other districts really struggling in this area and they, and they don't even know what to do half the time and when that happens. And they're, they're looking then for help and then you have to incur expenses from outside help. So it's really good business practice to do that. It always is, no matter what, even if you don't have turnover. But, but take, you know, we're taking the time now to kind of remind districts of that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I could just pull up two quick financial numbers from the main financial statements. Um, most entities um, focus on their ending general fund fund balance. So just as of 6-30-22, at this, so essentially what you had to start the school year, your general fund was at $8.6 million, and that was against annual expenditures of $42 million. So you have uh, about 20% uh, of your annual expenditures which in your fund balance. Um, ideally, that percentage would be slightly higher. It leads to the need to short-term borrow, but guys are doing what you need to do in terms of making sure that you have the cash flow to even out the you know, cash income that comes throughout the year. Um, those were the primary topics I wanted to discuss. Like I mentioned earlier, there is the upcoming new GASB accounting standard for um, subscription-based IT services. Um, and also, um, you guys still have ESSER funds to spend, so make sure you're spending those in accordance with the policy. Um, the guidelines of the grant, I do know ESSER 3 has slightly different requirements in terms of carryovers and reserves um, for specific classes um, compared to ESSER 1 and 2. So make sure you guys are staying up to date on all of that. Yeah, the, the subscription-based uh, um, standard coming up in this next summer here for, for 23 um, is going to be a little bit more robust, I think, in, in practice and applying it than the least standard. The least standard and, and this standard is going to go kind of very similar as far as what you have to do. You have to inventory all of your your um, uh, different agreements you have and things like that and subscriptions you have out there. Um, but I think for school districts in particular, it's going to hit a little bit harder as far as the workflow. There's going to be a little bit more out there. Just just because of the nature of school districts, they have a lot of these. Um, again, start early. Uh, leases didn't affect the district significantly. Um, they are affecting leases, are affecting county governments and city governments a whole lot more than they did the districts. So that's what is happening right now in calendar year 2023 for the 22 audits. I think the same and similar thing is going to happen for this subscription based for school districts. So just get on it early. It's not that complicated where you can't handle it. It's just a lot of time. And that's what uh, a lot of districts are struggling with right now. So reach out to, and, and, and we can help certainly uh, if you need help with that. Um, and any advice as far as how to approach that, but certainly get on it early. So. Paul, did you have a question? Yeah, swing back to the management letter. Uh, yeah. You started talking about the payroll liabilities. Yep. But never, uh, I guess I missed what you were saying. What is the problem? Uh, I thought that so, payroll yeah. taxes are pretty much set. Uh, we know what the insurance is costing us. Yes. Uh, so where, so, where is the disconnect? Yeah, it was essentially amounts are being withheld, um, but because of the way the accounting system works for the district, um, I believe it's Fund 98. Um, fund 98 is occasionally used as a holding fund, mm -hmm. and there were instances where just there was stuff in Fund 98 that didn't need to be there and need to get back in there. So it wasn't a situation where um, amounts were being improperly withheld from any employee's paycheck. It was just an internal accounting reconciliation issue. Um, so we got some financial data um, as part of the audit that needed adjustments to be made to make sure it was accurate. Um, we turned it back over to the district to say, hey, we, we said this does not look right. We turned it back over to the district. The district said, oh, yes, hang on, give us a little time. We'll, we'll work through it. And they were able to get us the correct liability withholding amounts. It just required some adjustments. Yeah, the disconnect was the timing. I mean, ultimately, everything was fine. That's why you didn't read about it in the audit. But from a from a, any kind of reconciliation system, whether it's cash or payroll liability, it really needs to be done monthly because then you catch things. Now, there was no issues, luckily, but or major issues. But really, we recommend, and that's why it's in the management letter, to do that monthly. And, and again, just, just simply because if you find something in the month of May, you've got to take care of it in the month of June, not after the audit in September or August. The management letter's not going to us. It doesn't follow anywhere. Yeah. It's kind of like the, the best practice of 
recommendations. Mm -hmm. It doesn't elevate to a binary or anything like that. So yep. Exactly. Thank you. You bet. Any other questions? Discussion on that motion. Questions or discussion on that motion. Hearing none, we will vote. All those in favor of that motion signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed, say nay. Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously on a voice vote. Next item on our agenda is the digital mapping grant and attached topic summary sheet was provided by Dale Bergman. We have a recommended motion from our facilities committee. Anyone willing to make a motion this evening? Ron? Make a motion to approve for CRG for digital mapping services. Motion from Ron. We have a second. Second from Paul. Any discussion or questions on the motion or topic? Discussion or questions on that motion or topic? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed, say nay. Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously on a voice vote. Next item on our agenda is the Head Start Transportation Waiver with an attached topic summary sheet from Ryan Martinovich and a recommended motion. Do we have a motion this evening? Paul? Move to approve, uh, recommend approval of the Head Start Transportation waiver for 23 and 2024. Motion by Paul, do we have a second? Second by Ron. Any discussion or questions on this motion or topic? Questions or discussion on the motion or topic? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed, say nay. Do any abstentions? Motion carries. Next item on our agenda is the open enrollment spaces available at MAPS. That's a 2011 Wisconsin Act. 114 discussion in 2015 Act 55 open enrollment for pupils with disabilities. Uh, the attached topic summary sheet was from Karen Baker. Uh, we do have a recommended motion from our CTP committee. Do we have a motion this evening? Maria? I move to approve the classroom capacity for you know, open enrollment purposes and to not deny students with disabilities based on space for the 2023-2024 open enrollment period. Motion by Maria. Do we have a second? Second by Jacqueline. Any discussion or questions on that motion or topic? Any discussion or questions on that motion or topic? <coughs> Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed, say nay. Any abstentions? Motion carries. Next item on our agenda is replacement of current policy 6222 budget with Neola's policy 6220 budget preparation. Attached topic summary sheet was provided by Dr. Kelly Strike and our recommended action or motion from our Finance Human Resources Committee. We have a motion this evening. Ron? Make a motion to approve deleting our current policy 6222 budget and replacing it with the oldest policy 6220 budget preparation. Motion by Ron. We have a second. Second by Paul. 
Any discussion or questions in regards to this topic or motion? Anything you'd like to highlight on that, Shannon or Kelly? No, I think that was allowing for some district flexibility going forward to allow all options and all tools to be in the toolbox for preparation for the future. The biggest change is just that um, deficit, deficit spending. Deficit spending yeah. opportunity yeah. if we should need to or agree to. Uh, any other questions on this motion or topic? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed, say nay. Any abstentions? Motion carries. Next item on our agenda is donation of funds from the Beerman Family Foundation, Inc. and the Merrill Aqua J Swim Team for Bleachers at the Prairie River Middle School Pool. Attached was the topic summary sheet from Dale Bergman as well as the donation form with a recommended approval and motion from our facilities committee. Do we have a motion this evening? Paul? I move to I move to recommend approval of the purchase and donation of bleachers as presented upon receipt of funds from the Beerman Family Foundation Incorporated in the amount of sixty six hundred dollars and the Merrill Aqua J swim team at three thousand dollars. Motion by Paul, do we have a second? Second by Ron. Do you have any discussion or questions on that motion or topic? Any question or discussion on the motion or topic? Hearing none, we will vote. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed, say nay. Any abstentions? Motion carries unanimously on a voice vote. Next item on our agenda is the 2023-24 budget reduction update. This is a placeholder for information only for some discussion. I will turn that over to Shannon if there was anything to introduce there, please. Thank you. I just I wanted to run through a couple of things as we get into the budget reduction season where that's going to really start picking up here between now and so at the end of March, I just kind of wanted to revisit a few things just to make sure it was on the same page moving forward. Uh, and again, Kelly and I had shared the plan where we will uh, present the board with essentially three tiers of budget reductions, one being ESSER related reductions, one being uh, budget reductions related to decline enrollment and right sizing, and then the third being uh, budget deficiencies essentially tied to referendum or, or short, shortcomings. And so, uh, we have worked with the building principals, the departments, to kind of start, uh, not start building, but um, establishing that list. And so from there, uh, next Tuesday, we'll meet with uh, uh, the ALP team and the administrators to kind of talk through final recommendations and uh, really start to focus on identifying the impacts. I think it was Kendra that mentioned, you know, let's, what are the, let's measure the impacts of these reductions as best we can so you can make informed decisions and so we'll start typing that up. On the 8th, uh, we will bring um, that list of those recommendations to um, HR Finance for um, first look at discussions, those kind of things. And I'll defer to, to Kevin and the board how they want to proceed as far as how that gets to the larger board. Um, and Kevin and I can talk about that at a different time. Um, we, um, and we'll also have that discussion about, at that time, potentially uh, Entertaining the, the idea of deficit spending and how far we would go with that as a as a um, as an option, and then we'll also have we'll have a pretty tight recommendation as far as here's what we are recommending, uh, but the board of course will have that kind of uh, a la carte freedom to make some decisions as, as they go. My recommendation is that uh, at, the, at the regular board meeting on the 15th um, that ideally we would uh, finalize those recommendations. That's coming up really, really fast, or perhaps a special board meeting might be needed after that at best. Once those reductions are identified, then we have to start attaching the personnel side to those positions. And so that work will be done uh, essentially from uh, February 15th, uh, if those decisions are made at the regular board meeting, through, um, they have to be done by the end of, end of March. And so uh, I would recommend that we do those things in that window of February 15th to 
eight, if possible, with all administrators working together to see, you know, bumping, you know, bumping, and all those kind of things, and making sure that the right people are assigned to those things. Uh, March eighth is the next finance HR meeting. After that, we would present that there. We should go to the next board meeting on the fifteenth. Delivering notice of non renewal have to be the teachers by the thirty first. So that's kind of the time. Frame. The reason I share that and I wanted to keep that front is because um, we actually have our first or a first significant reduction uh, coming up in the personnel report that I wanted to share and kind of highlight because uh, administrators have a different time frame statutorily. They have to be non renewed by the end of January, so that count, count takes things and speed that process up. And so one of the discussions that we had had through defining enrollments and some other things was to um, reduce administrative position in that position. When combined with people services and other things, um, it will be coming out of Kate Goodrich as the assistant principal. Now, um, I want to highlight that today for a couple of reasons. One is because it's in the personnel report as a resignation, and Heather's here tonight. She's uh, um, resigning from that AP job to go back to teaching ranks and really take one of the team is probably the best way to describe that. So, um, But it, it's very easy for that to get lost in a personnel report. And so um, I think as we do these things for our benefit and for the community's benefit, that we keep these things off the file because administration is always the hot, the hot one. So the first casualty of this process is an administrator that doesn't appear as a non renewal It's hidden in a personnel report, if that makes sense. And so, um, so I wanted to kind of share that. And uh, we obviously this year, with the potential of a referendum in 24, will want to do a very good job of communicating those kind of things, all reductions, and all things that are saving the deficit spending, you know, uh, those kind of things. So um, that's why I wanted to give that update. And um, I'll any questions that you have. Yeah, sure. Because this is the first I didn't get a chance to look at it. So I looked at last month, we don't have Posting for instructional coach, you just add that. A posting for is the Well, I'm just because we have. La I pulled up last month's. And we have all these open positions. It doesn't say anything about instructional coach on there. It, it won't be. A, it won't be a posting. It'll be a slider back in the, to the spot. But it doesn't show that we had an opening. I guess it's not a posting. We didn't, it doesn't show that we have an opening from last month. Also be able to we don't technically have an opening, we have reductions for us. I understand what you're saying. Yeah, there is no opening. Yeah. So I just want to say I got a lot of heartburn with this. <laughs> um, I'm sure you all do because Heather is amazing. <laughs> Um, so, sorry, emotional, but I'm sure it is for all of you. Yeah, so on the 6th, Linda, myself, Kelly, Heather, Heather, we'll sit down and figure out how to make this work. Yeah. I don't like it, but I'm sure you don't either. Yeah. So, um, that was the first of some very difficult discussions with there.
understanding, it was kind of like a um, decision move as well, right? What I understood from what she decided she wanted to do was go back down to the teaching. Uh, accepted so is probably a better term. Accept, okay. Yeah. Then I misunderstood. I thought it was kind of a, a decision that was partially made on that as well to, to go back to the original. It was our request. Okay, yeah. the re okay. then I'm good. Okay. Um, and, and Chad, I will hardly um, that Chad? I just, first off, I echo Maria. It's very sad. Um, I do just have a question to Chad's point earlier. And only because I feel like this has been a topic that has come up in past meetings. So if there's not, I didn't know if there wasn't an open position that we could transfer from a one level to a different level. Like I think we had, I don't know if you recall that conversation we're in the auditorium. And so I just, I am, thank you. And I'm sorry that this is, like I, I truly am, I just am looking for clarification moving forward as to what that direction is with all of the moving parts we have. Yeah, so the so the, uh, the next discussion that we'll have is about um, coaches moving into classrooms um, because we'll be using some there, and then uh, classroom teachers bumping other classroom teachers. So the the downward shifts mm -hmm. are different than me being Heather as principal director. So it doesn't have to be a full cool team, like. Well, we have like this pool of. of Positions and a pool of people that you know, we have to you know, work through. I mean, Heather was an instructional coach last year, remember? Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, That's nothing against her. I'm just no, curious to understand the process. It's a big like, overall. The whole picture. overall, because yeah. I yeah. feel like there was confusion last year, which I think is maybe why Chad is asking his question. And so I'm just trying to get insight. That's all. So it's okay to move. In this situation, we can just. You guys can make the authority to. Like, that's how it. I'm not coming across I, clear I, enough, I, I but your, yeah, go ahead, because I don't want to like I don't want to like go into the history of like what the I just you know. and I appreciate everything that all of you are saying, but I think essentially the choice is by the end of January we could non renew and mm -hmm. that an individual would be non renewed did not have a position. Um, we had a conversation to offer if you don't sometimes you don't want the non renewal you, you yeah. could opt to resign. Yeah. You can give that offering to teachers in a non renewal like the same would happen for teachers. Um, we chose as a district to offer her a teacher contract for 23-24. Um, instructional coaches, although by title, they said everyone gets a teacher contract. We opted to re want to keep her as an employee, offer her a contract that essentially brings her back to the teacher pool for 23-24. Come March, we may have to make some decisions to eliminate some teaching positions, instructional coaching positions, whatever. She's part of that pool, if that makes sense. So the option, we could have said, you're not renewed to that individual, or she could resign and not offer anything, and she would be not retained in Merrill. Right now, she, by offering this and you're approving the contract, she's back in the teaching pool for consideration when all those other things happen. Does that make sense? It, it, it does, and I'm glad that Heather has chosen to stay um, because she's a very bright future. But I think, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, before you came to MAPS, we had a, a big conversation about this in the auditorium because we were confused about somebody taken from this slot and put into a not posted position where others didn't have a chance to apply. So I think what we're trying to get is how do you guys do that? I mean, is it just random or if somebody is put in a lower spot on the salary scale, if you will, that that can be done, but they can't go up without posting? I mean, what's the posting? Criteria. What's you don't have to post position post that time. If you want to just the legal. Okay. Of that. Um, reduction in the workforce is pretty. It's like a two sentence statement. Um, that's pretty broad in how we make those. But I would say that things such as in my, I can't refer to your auditorium conversation. Right. And if we're teetering on what you should and shouldn't talk about. No. <laughs> but I would tell you this that um, you can you know years of service performance um, licensure. All those things can factor into to what may happen. So in a reduction um, of force. Situation. In a reduction of force. Yep. Those would be. Yep. Okay. So a reduction of force situation is different than normal day-to-day -day operations of maps and how we post. Yeah, I think the discussion that maybe and I'm telling Marcia, I'm trying to be, um, I'm just saying, I'm a, 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 
it was a matter of how does someone become this new position without being posted. I think is the spirit of that discussion. It was, yes. It was kind of a, it was, it was a lateral move. It was, we were told by the other administrator that or did not need Yeah, what appeared to be a uh, promotion. No, promotion, I thought he said he had to. If there was anybody else, he told us lateral move. That was a whole reduction. That was our whole reduction with all the other schools. Yeah. As long as it was lateral, they could do whatever they want. Yeah. This, to me, if this is lateral, well, then all it is is... It's not that it's you're making two decisions, really, yeah, on this personnel right. report. But either way, I mean, so my problem was with my original question is, I mean, it's, you're, you're saying you're doing a reduction, but you may have, I have an issue with making positions. You know, all you, all you, I understand there's other things involved, but basically you took and changed the wording on the chart from assistant principal to instructional coach. No, that's absolutely not it. Correct. So the, the administrator and the uh, assistant principal, the job duties and job description policies are very different. And so that position is gone. Temporarily, we have, I guess, in theory, an extra instructional coach. We won't have in March. And this gets clear to help. We're supposed I, to be open, and we want to be more open. That's the way this happened. That's not being open in my mind. So. But if, okay. it, if it was, how would it be open? The position's gone. You, yeah. No, that position's the, the gone. Could, yeah, but now you put her in another position. Which will be eliminated in a month. Mm -hmm. So the budget reduction is coming. Right. But we have, the budget reduction is coming. So we're approving two reductions. The associate principal position is gone. It won't be filled. The budget reduction of But you didn't have an assistant coach even listed in our any of our job stuff you didn't have them so you just made it but it doesn't matter yes it does you didn't save anything but because we haven't gotten that far it happens oh. at the end of march you you just filled her into assistant uh, uh, correct because we are eliminating the position at the end of march so she that's her job yeah. next year this is for next year correct but so the position and the sixty six thousand this position and made this position the $66,000 that's tied to that position on that personnel report gets eliminated from the budget at the end of March when we make the budget reductions. The associate principal position was eliminated with her transferring to that position. Now, you could screw up her entire career by offering her a non-renewal at the end of January, and it screws up her life, and it also puts a bad reputation on maps for non-renewing administrators. And it makes it harder for five years down the road if we change declining enrollment and we have to hire new uh, administrators we have this reputation of uh it might last for five years but you're, you're going to get non-renewed the position's eliminated and won't be filled that position is saved for the budget that's gone that whatever that salary was tied to i don't know what it is off the top of my head at the end of march after all the other budget reductions are done the sixty-six thousand dollars that you're looking at will be gone why will it be gone because the positions are going to be eliminated but she has to be moved to a different category in the job pool. As a whole. But Chad, I get this. There's no, right. I don't know if there's a clear way to do this. I guess, I guess, I guess that it would be nice to get it ahead of time to what the ask questions. I guess I'm not going to get belittled just because. In my mind, all you did was move money. You move money from here to here. For today. But it's going to be a, it's going to be an AP position reduced. Which leads back to the timing of when non-renewals are the difference between administrative staff versus non-administrative staff. And yes, in the, in the short term chat, I do see what you're saying, or it, it looks like a shell game. It is not intended to be that. It is looking at it one step at a time. Because as I understand, if, if everybody's contract would be March, we wouldn't be talking we about any of this right now, but because it's an administrator. Yeah. Okay. So we don't anticipate any of these other situations like this. Um, however, when we see the, the grander list <coughs> next month, um, you'll see very well how the slots in there. It is, it is truly a reduction. An unusual condition. Discussion and questions on the motion tied to the personnel report. 
any other questions or discussions based on that motion or this topic? Call the question to the vote then. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Nay. Any abstentions? Motion carries on a voice of vote. This time, before we get into the consent agenda, does anyone want anything pulled from our consent agenda this evening? Otherwise, I will ask for consent agenda motion. Maria? Move to, move to approve consent agenda items A through C, which includes minutes of the December 21, 2022 and January 11, 2023 meetings claims, vouchers, and receipts totaling $3,214,808.08 and donations totaling $11,184. By Maria, do we have a second? Second by Jacqueline. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Do we have any abstentions? Linda? I'm going to abstain from the January 11th. Meeting minutes. Brett? Abstain from the December 21st meeting minutes. Maria? I will abstain from December 21st meeting minutes. Paul? Abstain from December 21st and January 11th minutes. Thank you. Motion carries with the noted people abstaining from those minutes. Uh, items for future meeting this time. Uh, Talked about this as a placeholder. If there's any items people would like to discuss, either to be brought as to the board of the whole for the next month's meeting or any committee meetings, uh, you certainly can still uh, do this in the other manner. If you don't have ideas tonight and you think of something for the regular board meeting, you can get in touch with Shannon and myself. Otherwise, contact the committee chairs. But at this time, I would ask if anyone has. Items for future meetings. All right. Hearing nothing, we'll go down. Just a reminder tomorrow uh, morning radio program uh, highlighting uh, tonight's meeting. Uh, it'll be approximately 8.15 in the morning at. Blue Jay 730 radio station. Uh, Superintendent Murray and I will be on there just highlighting tonight's meeting. Uh, other additional or future meetings, uh, as a reminder, we have Bridges Virtual Academy Governance Board meets on uh, Thursday, February 2nd at 12.45 p.m. They meet virtually. We do have the CTP or Curriculum Technology Pupil Services Committee meeting on Wednesday, February 8th at 4.30 p.m. in the boardroom. We have a Finance Human Resources Committee meeting Wednesday, February 8th, 5 p.m. in the boardroom. The Head Start Policy Council is Tuesday, February 14th, 5.30 p.m. at Ten River School for Young Learners. Our next regular uh, Board of Education meeting is Wednesday, February 15th, 5.30 p.m. here in uh, the boardroom. Uh, that covers all the meetings. Uh, this time I would look and ask for a meeting, uh, motion to adjourn. Yes. Second. Yeah. Motion by Brett, second by Linda, third by Maria. All those in favor of motion to adjourn at 6.55, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Amen. Motion period.